Soon the Toonerville trolley was removed? What the fu- The Seattle area is home to plenty of neighborhoods and suburbs, each with their own interesting history. We'll be exploring some of them and their stories in depth as we build our tram lines. If you liked the stories and history from the last couple episodes, and you want more of that, you'll be happy to know that that's about 80% of the content of this video. If you didn't like those stories, um, just give these a chance, and if you don't like them, tell me in the comments, please. We'll be starting by building in the north of Seattle. Visualize Ballard. The Ballard of today is the place where we take a historic Asian war, peasant, and famine food and market it as a $12 plus comfort food. Now I guess in the grand scheme of things that's cheap for Seattle, but I mean you can easily just make congee on your own, just put too much water in the rice cooker. Anyway, Ballard's a neighborhood of Seattle with a long history. It was, for a time, its own city. Problem. No one wanted Ballard. The first European settler was a guy named Ira Wilcox Utter, who staked a claim on the land. But then, basically, no one else came. So, Wilcox sold the land to a judge named Thomas Burke. 36 years later, Burke and his buddies are a part of the West Coast Improvement Company, and they think it would be good business for them, and basically everyone else, if they built a railroad connecting back east. Burke and boys have some trouble with money and financing, but eventually they get the money, and they get an agreement with their bankers back east, so they build a railroad line all the way to Snohomish. Problem. Rival railway companies. Specifically, rival railway companies that already have permission from the Supreme Court to build all the bridges across the Snohomish River. Burke and friends decide, well, whatever, we'll build our bridges anyway. This causes problems because Northern Pacific, the guys with the permission, get angry. They send a guy to Washington and go to the court to, you know, protest about it to the government. The government says, yeah, uh, sure. And they give that guy a piece of paper that says, you know, hey, these other guys, they're not supposed to be building these bridges. Uh, what the hell's going on here? Now, Burke is not only privy to this information, he has the eyes of an eagle. He sees the guy with the writ in his hands leaving the courthouse. So coincidentally, his company's train is about to make its maiden trip all the way up to Snohomish, where they've completed the track to this point. They just haven't crossed the river. So picture this. Burke is a man of action, and he does what any man of action would do. Burke runs. He books it. At lightning speed, he runs towards the train depot. All these people are gathered on these platforms waiting to get on this train so that they can be on the first trip to Snohomish from Seattle. Burke maybe has one of his buddies with him, but they are running through the streets. They run, they see the train that's supposed to be leaving. They jump into the train cab, you know, the front with the engine and everything, and they talk to the engineer. Burke says, hey, I'm an officer on this railway and I'm a judge. Decouple the carriages. The poor engineer is standing there, he says, well, uh, sure sounds good to me, boss, if you, you know, take the responsibility. Burke says, I will. So the engineer decouples the passenger carriages, and all these poor people, the, they see the train they're supposed to be on just zoom right past them. Obviously, Burke makes it to Snohomish in blinding speed, uh, and he goes to the sheriff, who apparently he maybe knows pretty well. And so Burke says to the sheriff, Hey, don't you think there are some desperados around here that you and your deputies ought to be trailing? The sheriff catches Burke's drift and basically says, Well, you know, there are always desperados, Mr. Burke. Burke tells him, Hey, that you know, there's this man saying we can't build this bridge. And, uh, yeah, you guys just leave, and I'll give you the sign when the coast is clear. Burke and the buddy he brought with him then get to work trying to find every able hand they can and hire them to finish the bridge. So by the time the guy with the writ actually arrives in Snohomish County and tries to find the sheriff, the bridge is already built and the sheriff is nowhere to be found. The best parts of the story are that Burke got away with it. He, he committed obstruction of justice, essentially, and he got away with it. And that this whole thing of him, like, telling the sheriff to go somewhere else, apparently, according to Wikipedia, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt, this, it says this happened at least once. So, it, potentially, this happened another time. I think Thomas Burke is a character that I would love to do, like, an actual full-length video just on him. That dude lived a crazy life. They must have amnesia. They forgot that- No one wanted Ballard. 
I think maybe the second funniest story when it comes to Ballard has to do with its naming. You know, it's not called Burke Town or whatever. In the late 1880s, the West Coast Improvement Company dissolves. And so all of the property and all the stuff is up for grabs, including Burke's land that will become a part of the city of Ballard. Now, of course, no one wants Ballard, right? So it comes down to a coin toss. And Captain William Ballard, he loses the coin toss. And so he is stuck with Ballard. Keep in mind, this wasn't like you get Ballard or a better place. The coin toss was you get Ballard or you don't get anything. <laughs> and so he lost. He lost and he got stuck with Ballard. This is the funniest. Ballard was controversially annexed by Seattle on account of its water problems. And there is a running joke of the Ballard liberation movement. So, Green Lake's a place. All you need to know is that Green Lake was named by a guy who scouted it during the height of its seasonal algae blooms, uh, when of course it smells terrible. It was later settled by a German guy named Erhard Seifried. Oh yeah, by the way, the algae in this lake is called blue-green algae, or cyanobacteria, and it's toxic. There are about a thousand one things in this lake that will give you swimmer's itch, or a disease previously unknown to science. However, since it's lakefront property, homes in this area will sell for over a million dollars. Ravenna is a beautiful and conveniently located area of Seattle. Ravenna is famous for its beautiful park, and this park was once home to Old Growth Forest, and of course the trees in this forest were massive. Think 13 feet in diameter, 274 feet high. Some of these trees even had names, so they weren't trees, they were more like tree people. One day, people noticed the trees were mysteriously disappearing. They questioned the parks department, asking whether or not, you know, they were cutting the trees down. The department just went, um, uh, no? Look, um, the trees, they're rotten and dying, and we need to do it for public safety. Meanwhile, the superintendent was pocketing massive amounts of money by selling 63 cords of firewood just from the biggest tree. If this doesn't make you at least a little angry, I don't know what will. Okay, so that tram line's been built. How about we build something in more downtown Seattle? I started planning out a tram line that would connect all the way through Madison Street and go all the way down to downtown Seattle. Madison Park is an area of Seattle with plenty of Seattle landmarks, including the Seattle Japanese Garden, the Washington Park Arboretum, and a good view of the Evergreen Point Bridge, which is the longest floating bridge in the world. The Evergreen Point Bridge is accompanied by, of course, the second longest floating bridge in the world, and that's the bridge that goes to Mercer Island. In fact, four of the five longest floating bridges in the world are in Washington State, and the reason why that is is really to do with geography. Now, Lake Washington, while it's not the deepest lake in Washington State, it is very deep at about 214 feet or so, or about 65 meters. Lake Washington isn't only deep, its floor is also very soft. And the problem with that is, if you wanted to build an actual suspension bridge, you would not only have to build it at a depth, you know, able to reach the floor, it would also have to be able to reach very solid ground to be able to sustain the bridge, which means, you know, this bridge would have to be incredibly tall. So not only is this floating bridge a marvel of human engineering, it's also quite pragmatic. Next up is Capitol Hill, which is an absolutely beautiful part of Seattle. It's also known for fun parties. Capitol Hill is also home to Lakeview Cemetery, which is where Bruce Lee and Brandon Lee are buried. Bruce Lee lived in Seattle for five years, from 1959 to 1964, during which time he was studying at UW. Just a side note, since I've seen that a lot of people from outside of the region watch these videos, um, surprisingly enough, I should note for you guys that UW is just the way that we, Washington natives, actually say the acronym UW for University of Washington. Bruce Lee is also known to have had a favorite Chinese restaurant in Seattle, which was called Tai Tung. And he would go there often, and if you are to go there today, it's still in operation, and you can see a bunch of pictures of him on the walls. Also in Cap Hill, there's a statue of a famous Seattle native, Jimi Hendrix. Now, downtown Seattle is a mixture of beautiful and terrifying. Let's start with the terrifying. One of the tram stations we set up is right outside the Seattle Central Library. So here we are, this is a picture of the Seattle Central Library. And as you can see, it is huge. And some people say that it is decidedly unpleasant. Octopuses is the, the Kraken is coming out. We got a short story dispenser. And you got this, uh, um... Okay, so, yep, here it is. This is the Carnegie Library that was um, one of the Carnegie Libraries built in Seattle. 
And this this was constructed in 1906 uh, after funding by, yeah, Andrew Carnegie, who funded, I think, maybe four or five others in Seattle. And this was the central library uh, until 1960-something. Yeah, so the Moore Theater was constructed in, like, the early 1900s. It's the oldest, uh, if you don't know, it's the oldest operating, um, like, performing arts theater. Like, think, like, opera or stage theater in Seattle. Okay, so we have built a direct tram station right outside of Seattle Art Museum. And if we look up here, there's no marking on the map, but right here is H Mart. Uh, we have an H Mart in Tacoma. H Mart is like, it's predominantly a Korean supermarket. Uh, in general, I guess you could say an Asian supermarket. So I think that's quite valuable to have in our community being well connected. And then of course, right across, there's also the Christian Science Reading Room. I don't know what that is, but um, there we go. There we go. Yeah, that frequency is a little weird, maybe, but, um, you know, I imagine if you're going here, you're going to the art museum. And, uh, yeah. Then, what's over here? There's the Untitled Mural. Now, what people might not know about Seattle, if, uh, they're not from here, is that Seattle is well known for Asian fusion cuisine, as well as, yeah, having lots of Japanese Americans. Um, so in this area, in downtown. It's not even the International District, but in this area right here, you'd be in basically proximity to about quite a f about to quite a few um, Asian restaurants or Japanese restaurants. There's one called the Donburi House, <laughs> and another, like as you can imagine, plenty of teriyaki restaurants and things like that. Um, since that teriyaki is basically what Seattle is known for, right? Uh, so we may as well showcase that. And I thought it would be a funny joke to just totally ignore the Space Needle, but uh, for the people not from the area, if we just go up to the north, yeah, that's where the Space Needle is. The next thing we did was to start building a streetcar line all the way to Magnolia. That way we could make another connection to the loop line. And of course, on the way there is Queen Anne. Queen Anne is known for its architecture, and of course, it's being named after the Queen Anne style of Victorian houses. It's beautiful. Yeah, look. Oh. Oh. Um. Okay, well, ignore that. Well, that's nice. Look at that. That's nice. So we got the, uh, Rudolph out here. They are their own style. But we have all of these houses just like this. And, uh... Yeah, they're pretty popular. We got tons of them in Tacoma, too. But, uh... That one's nice! Look at that. That's cute. We finished this line and connected it to the East Magnolia Station. Okay, so we have just built a new tram line uh, running through those neighborhoods. So, yeah, from... Well, not through Magnolia yet. We'll have a separate line uh, connecting here from Balmer Yard. But, uh, it goes through Salmon Bay Village, which I think is like... Isn't that an RV park? Okay, um, and Martin Square, right next to Seattle Pacific University. So I, I put this here, because this is the parking lot. Uh, or at least one of them. And so I decided, yeah, let's have the, the streetcar stop right here. That would make sense. And then it goes right next to this, this cemetery, and this park right here. Uh, right through the center of Queen Anne, and we stop at Mont Lake, um, right in the center of it too, and right, right on top of the subway station we built. So easy transfers, you know, people can get all the way from East Magnolia, all the way, all the way, all the way, over to basically right next to UW. Um, yeah, that seems good. And I have set up the line. And I put eight uh, streetcars on it, eight of the Skodas. I don't know if that'll be enough, but that's what we went with. Um, I'm not sure how people in Seattle would pronounce that. They just say Mont, Mont Lake, Mont Lake. 
I, I mean, I speak French, so I tend to pronounce it like mon. Uh, but there we go. Um, look at him go. That's great. And one thing that I realized I could do, I, I'd never showed this off before. I'm so sorry. Um, if we turn off all of these map labels, all these PI labels, do all this, turn off the train icons, lines overlay. There we go. We have the lines overlay, so we can sort of see a really cool view of what our train lines look like. This is fantastic. We don't have a whole lot of lines that share tracks. We had this one over here, I think. One of them. Yeah, over here. Yellow and orange, you can't really see it too well. We made this station pretty useful. The Horizon Church one, that's got to change too. I changed some of these names. Still, I haven't I haven't fixed that. Um, we had the Seattle Central Library one, First Hill. What else did we change? Oh, the Seattle University Quad North. We changed that. What we need to do now is actually make some of these other stations uh, sort of useful and as far as transfers go. All right, the thing that's difficult about building in the Northwest is this. All right, park and ride is a name for a lot of things in Seattle. And usually when I think about it, it's um, it's like parking your car so you can ride the light rail or ride the train or something, right? Uh, and you'll see this. And then you'll look over here, we got Echo Lake. And we got this open sort of thing here. Now this game, this is sort of what it looks like sometimes when you are looking at the, the places where like rail is in real life but is not in the game you see they have this sort of streak this is where like a set of train tracks actually is right you have this thing where it says park and ride and you see this little thing boop, 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 like that go up but problem this is not where train tracks are in real life this is uh, like a park little trail and the park and ride this one here, it just means, um, it just means parking your car so you can ride your bike. <laughs> That's all it is. So it, it can be a bit confusing, the, uh, the, the nomenclature some of these people went with. But either way, it's what we got. Now, I'm not decided on whether or not I'll build it yet, but this is going to be a line connecting to Mercer Island. Mercer Island stereotype is that it's filled with rich people, and it's not a gated community, it's a moated community. Mercer Island wasn't always this way. Mercer Island used to be a, a bit of a bigger mix of middle class and upper middle class, and it, it became pretty wealthy uh, quite recently, actually. It's named after this guy, Thomas Mercer, who had a fantastic beard. I love it. We sort of have to do it this way because otherwise the game won't let us build a train line, but just imagine that this is also a floating train bridge. That's the head cannon for this. My plan for this line is that it will keep going east and then eventually southeast, going through Snoqualmie Pass and the Cascades, and then eventually connecting to the Tri-Cities. But this is a very, very far future plan. Snoqualmie, I've, I've personally never driven out this way. But man, it's beautiful. Oh my god. Um, I mean, this this area, you see all the all the nature around you. I mean, this this sort of town area. I mean, you've seen this town a dozen times. Yeah, pretty calm, pretty nice place. I think it needs a train. After building a train station in Snoqualmie, I then set my sights back towards West Seattle and Burien and White Center. Now, this area is pretty interesting, and I did not know anything about it besides what I knew before about Alki Point and all that. Um, I did want to create a network of streetcars uh, so that they could connect to different, different stations along the main line. I think this right here is a Mexican restaurant, so that guy will be happy that there are two tram stops right next to his restaurant. Dude, he's going to be slinging burritos 24-7, man. That guy's... And we got another... Para los Niños. Okay. And we got a... Latino Civic and Cultural Center. 
Does Burian have a lot of, like, Latinos? What's going on? Okay, I, I don't know the proper... Um, 21.9% of the people in Burian, Washington are Hispanic. But then I learned something even more amazing about Burian. Okay, Burian deep dive, let's go! Okay, European settlement in the Burian area dates to 1864. Okay, when a French-Canadian guy purchased some land, and he was living there. And he, oh, three years after purchasing his homestead in the Burian area, he married 14-year-old Elizabeth Kushner. In 1915, the Lake Burian Railway was completed. It ran on what is today Ombaum Boulevard from Burian to White Center to Seattle. A small passenger train ran the tracks and was affectionately named by the residents the Tunerville Trolley. However, in the summer, squished, caterpill squished caterpillars made the tracks slippery, and in the winter, the tracks iced over. Soon, the Tunerville Trolley was removed? What the fu- I have to find out if this is real. I have to find out if this is real. A difficult line. There are numerous stories about problems on the line. Along the wooded stretch in spring, for instance, caterpillars falling off the trees were sometimes so numerous they made the tracks slick. Kids sometimes hung onto the outside to avoid the fare, which was paid inside the cars. Drivers told stories about passengers shooting wildlife on their way through the woods? Okay, well, the caterpillars won't get us this time. Anyway, you can see um, we're taking quite a bit of time to be able to get the money to be able to afford other things. I'm thinking I'm going to build all of this stuff in, a, in installments, right? Um, like this Mercer Island stuff, this will be expensive. Uh, like this expansion to the east, this will be super expensive. And then I have to also be able to afford to put trains on it, or else people will get angry. So I need to get enough money to be able to do that, and that's sort of my fault. So, everyone, here we are. We have fast-forwarded a little bit in the future, and um, I, I also tested some things. But first, uh, yes, I did build this line. We call it the Southeast Line. Um, going from Seattle, starting at King Street Station, and going all the way so far to Issaquah. We have two stations here. This game is way more forgiving than games like Open TTD. And Open TTD, you know, you need to get your signals right when you play that game. This one, it's a lot, uh, it's a lot simpler. If we look at this, okay, uh, maybe if we can catch one of them coming back. Oh, okay, so he, this train is going, and may, oh, it will stop at the signal here and check, and then this blue one will pass, and it doesn't need another signal here or here, like an open TTD to say, this part of the line is open, it just goes. Once it is pretty aware that it doesn't have to stop for the train ahead of it, I guess it just goes. And you can see it's pretty streamlined. It will wait here, and yeah, that's probably a good thing. We can't really stop that, but it will wait for about 30 seconds before going in to King Street Station. So that is um, pretty good. It's not, it's not a terrible system. It, I think, is a lot more forgiving and a lot easier for people to deal with than games like, yeah, Open TTD. So everyone, yeah, uh, let me know what you think. This video have too many stories in it, not enough stories in it. If you liked them, um, let me know which one was your favorite one. And if you didn't like them, just also let me know that too. Uh, I want to make good videos for you guys, and uh, I want to find a good video length that is watchable and accessible to everyone. Yeah, let me know what you think. Uh, as always, bye-bye.